next speaker uh, is Fred Tomaselli. He's talking about um, my chemical sublime. I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating to use the word um, talk because although he'll be speaking, it's, he's an artist, a visual artist, and so you're going to see uh, an, an, a beautiful array of his, uh, of his beautiful artwork. Uh, Fred Tomaselli um, has had numerous solo exhibitions, including the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth and the University of Michigan Museum of Art, survey exp um, exhibitions, and has toured uh, four venues in Europe. Um, his works, at, uh, he's been at the Whitney Museum of Modern Art, for example. His works have been uh, included in international biennial exhibitions, including Sydney, Santa Fe, w the Whitney, and others. His work can be found in public collections or institutions such as the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of Modern Art, the Brooklyn Museum, uh, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA. I'm going to turn you over to Fred Tomaselli uh, to tell us about psychedelic art. Fred. Um, thanks for coming uh, so early in the morning. Um, I grew up uh, in the shadow of Disneyland so that basically every night around 9 o'clock I would look up into the sky and see Tinkerbell flying through the air amid the fireworks bursting about her. And, and I, I thought that was normal, um, or I didn't have anything to compare it to at least. And, um, and, and, and this idea of like, I guess I was, um, I guess I grew up very um, comfortable with this idea of immersive artificial reality. And so much so that like when I saw my first actual real waterfall, I was, I was looking for the pumps and the conduit that were running it. And when, they, when I found out that it was actually just water coming off of a mountain, it blew my mind. And, um, and so for me, I guess, you know, uh, unreality was almost the realest thing there was. And, um, and so basically, um, I moved to New York in uh, 1985, and I started like uh, started putting this sort of like this this past behind me, uh, and trying to figure out what it meant. I mean, I grew up in this sort of like mall culture. Uh, I was basically a stoner, which is basically a hippie without ideology. I mean, I, I grew up with you know in the 70s, which is basically the the 60s with birth defects, and and so instead of Instead of, I don't know, settling, instead of moving for transcendence, I think we, my friends and myself, settled for oblivion. And so, um, so anyway, I, I came to New York and uh, the first thing I did was I, I stopped being a painter. I guess I felt like um, very burdened by the history of, of painting and I just didn't feel like I could do anything with the media that... Uh, would be relevant to my life. So I, so I began doing a lot of installations and performance works. Um, I'm going to show you just one to give you a context for the work that came after. This is a work called Cubic Sky. Um, let me see if I can make this work. Um, it was uh, basically what I did was I took a map of the heavens, which circular, stretched it out into a square, gridded up the square into 30 units, and then folded them up onto themselves thereby containerizing the infinite. Um, this is a, uh, these are these little uh, plexiglass boxes with lights in the inside, and each one of these facets um, slavishly demarcates uh, a, a facet of the universe. At the time, I was thinking that man looking up into the heavens was the oldest way that I could think of of him turning himself back on his back to the world. And, I wanted to both deliver an escapist experience while, though, while, while simultaneously commenting on that experience. And I guess I was utilizing the tropes that I found in theme parks, uh, specifically in Disneyland and uh, the, these things that I had kind of grown up around. Uh, and, and then anyway, so I'm not going to show you, I did a ton of installations. Uh, that piece, by the way, is uh, currently being shown at Mass Mocha uh, until April, so if you ever want to see it, it's there. Um, but then um, that kind of led to like, um, you know, for 10 years I did all this stuff, and then I started doing these little drawings that were coming out of uh, plain air drawings. I was, I was a Sunday painter. I, I, 
Um, I didn't really believe that, you know, what I was doing as, as an artist was really, as a, vi as a painter, was, was very interesting. But I started doing these little maps. Uh, this is a, I don't know if, uh, oh yeah, this was uh, every rock band I can remember seeing. This kind of comes out of Cubic Sky. And, um, and, and, and uh, you can see it's sort of like maybe uh, two lobes of a mind two sides of a brain coming together. That also then led to another work called Every Rock Band I Can Remember Seeing Mixed with Every Vertebrae in North America that's become extinct since 1492. I know it's a long title. But, um, but it was about seeing and not seeing, about nature and culture. Uh, it, was, it, it, it was about, um, it was also maybe positioning me, my own personal hedonism, uh, within the context of a world that was falling apart around me. Um, but then that led to um, what I call chemical celestial portraits. Um, what I ended up doing was I, I would give my friends questionnaires where I would ask them to uh, list every drug they could remember taking and uh, to give me their birth date. The birth date would correspond to an astrological or astronomical sign that would then correspond to an astrological location. And then what I would do is I'd put pills and sugar on, on photographic paper uh, and expose it to light in a photogram process, a, a cameraless uh, photographic process, and then relabel the stars with every drug they took. So they became chemical celestial portraits, portraits of inner space and outer space. Uh, that then led to this, this, uh, this is just uh, uh, my 12 friends in the 12 houses of the zodiac. And as you can see, it kind of relates maybe to cubic sky insofar as I'm chopping up the infinite uh, or, um, and, and bracketing it. But anyway, so, so those, I guess, were my first sort of forays into two-dimensional art after a long hiatus. And I started thinking about paintings. And, um, um, and I started thinking, like, what are paintings for? And... Um, and I started thinking about how the rhetoric around psychedelic drugs uh, mirrored a lot of the pre-modernist uh, uh, ideals around art. This idea of losing yourself in this sublime world that was represented within uh, the painting. This idea of a painting as a, as a transportational vehicle to take you to other dimensions. Uh, this notion of the transcendent or sublime space within paintings. And I started thinking, like, that was extremely uncanny, and I couldn't understand why nobody was making those kinds of connections. Uh, because, you know, the art world is a very secular place, and I think psychedelics um, are, are kind of agents of mystery that sort of upend a sort of, like, sense of rigor among, like, many conceptual artists. But for me, um, being an artist, it's all about you know, thinking about perception. It's all about mining the ideas around perception. So for me, it was a very um, salient idea to explore. It was also, um, uh, it was also something that, um, that had, been, had a lot of personal meaning to me and, and was very um, um, responsible for, not just for the shape I was in, but for the shape that the world was in, in a funny way. Um, so anyway, um, I have this background as a surfboard maker. I, like I said, I grew up in Southern California. And I uh, then had this idea to like inlay drugs into, um, into uh, plywood and then resin them over to sort of preserve their water-soluble ephemeral qualities so that instead of going through the bloodstream to alter consciousness, they travel through the eyes. So it's a different route to altering perception. So this is one of the first works I made. It was a piece I made in 1990 called Big As Me. And it's a, a spinal cord made out of uh, Tylenol and aspirin, and uh, as big as me. And uh, then that led to this, this work here called 13,000, which is 13,000 aspirin that I, what I did was I routed slots into this plywood, uh, stacked it with aspirin and resined it over. And, um, and, and so, um, so then anyway, I started thinking, well, okay, so I'm working with pharmacological culture, uh, so over-the-counter drugs. I wanted to put some subcultural drugs in um, because for me, whether it was like 
about um, pharmacological culture or it was about drug subculture. It was all about changing your reality. If you had a headache, you took an aspirin, it went away, that was altering consciousness. If you smoked a joint um, and, you know, got a little happy, again, it was the same, it was, to me it was the same thing. So I started growing pot and uh, this is uh, one of the first works I made um, called uh, X Will Fade. Uh, this piece here, I knew that the leaves would change color over time. And so initially I painted all the leaves uh, about the color that they were in real life, except for the X, and it formed over time. But the thing about pot, when I started putting marijuana into the work, it didn't just put like subcultural um, or, or, or agents that, that connoted subcultural uh, relationships. It also put the shape of nature into my work. And, um, and then that actually became the biggest aspect of like, when I started putting the, le the, the kind of soft um, forms of the leaves against the hard geometries of drug manu uh, manufacturers, I, I really liked the friction that was there. So, but I also, uh, you know, had a lot of fun playing around with things. This is a work called uh, I Could See Your Voice, and it, it basically deals with synesthesia, and this, well, this idea of, like, the visualization of sound. And I was thinking about, like, oscilloscopes and Richter scales and audio strips and analog recording, and also the illegibility of psychedelia. Now, if, for those of you who haven't seen my work, um, uh, there's these sort of glossy resin surfaces that these objects are embedded in. And then there's often like layers of paint and collage material that float between layers. So there's a shadow play and dimensionality. They don't come through in the photographs, but um, that is, it, um, that, that's an aspect or a phenomenon uh, that is happening. So then... Um, this is a work I was really embarrassed about. Like I had started out as a, you know, basically utilizing geometric minimalism to talk about um, perception. And then uh, I made this work um, called Superplant. And it just seemed so, in, I don't know, gratuitously decorative that I was a little bit embarrassed about it. And, and what it is, is um, it's uh, six different psychoactive uh, materials. It's, uh, uh, these are, uh, uh, Morning Glory Siege, which contain an indole related to LSD, tobacco leaves, ephedra stems, hemp leaves, coffee beans, uh, and psilocybin mushrooms. And uh, the reason I call it super plant is, if it ever existed, it would, it would rule the world, <laughs> I think. But, um, but and, and so, and it, it is a basically, a, you know, it's a hybrid object. And, um, but it's also, not only is it a biological hybrid that couldn't exist in nature, but I think it's also a hybrid, a hybrid between various pictorial traditions. I was specifically thinking about Rajasthani miniatures and the way uh, uh, plants are depicted in a sort of flattened way, and also a um, uh, shaker tree of life that one sees here in, um, in, in, in a, from America. So I was sort of like conflating a, a lots of different kinds of hybridity, and and I also, you know, it also brings to light my own sense of hybridity, my own sense of like how these objects and substances have hybridized with my mind and, and, uh, and altered my consciousness. So uh, it's a piece called Utah Saint, uh, made uh, out, out of ephedra stems that I picked out in the desert. Um, these, these works are quite, kind of large, that's like eight by uh, six feet. Um, uh, it's a piece called, um, Oh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Self-annihilation event in hybrid garden. Um, this this work here um, was I was living upstate and um, I live I was living next to next to the Asopus River, and uh, I was working at a at a barn and I have to have pretty pristine working conditions for the resin and. Um, and no matter what I did, these bugs would land in, would get into the garage and land in my resin and screw everything up. So I said, okay, fine. If you can't beat them, join them. So I brought the canvases out into the meadow by the garage. I aimed these big lights at them. And then all these bugs came up off the river and they, when they were like storming around the lights, when they reached their apex, I poured this resin onto the surface of the piece and these bugs stuck and died in random formations thereby being kind of a portrait of the atmosphere and, and, and a reliquary of this sort of collision of nature and technology. And then what I did was um, 
I, uh, I cut in black around the bugs and then built this sort of, uh, th this collage where I inverted the narrative, in this case, these like hybrid bugs where I've, 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 I've added pills and leaves and photographic material are now hatching out of this cadaver out into the atmosphere um, and so that it turned into something else. And I also did other performative works in my studio. This is a work called Dermal Delivery or How I Quit Smoking. And uh, what I did was this is a six by nine foot work and I gritted it off and I was wearing nicotine patches and freaking out. And uh, basically, I was thinking about paint as skin. Uh, you know, there's this whole idea within art about like oil paint is, and you know, its fat content and its lusciousness as being the perfect vehicle to describe skin and the body. And so I started playing around with that. And, and in this case, there were like, I would rip my nicotine patch off, stick it onto the grid every day, and then started like putting in pieces of skin that I would cut out of magazines and Band-Aids and uh, uh, um, uh, nitroglycerin patches and other uh, fentanyl patches. And, and, uh, and then painted uh, bits, lodgings of, of skin tones. So anyway, uh, so anyway, I, um, so at a certain point I started thinking, okay, I want my work to take people to these other places. Where do I want to take them to? So I thought, well, I'm going to go to my, I'm going to take them to my favorite places. So, so this is a work called Ocotillo Nocturne, and, um, and, and it's based on some photographs I took. It's a painting, but it's based on some photographs I took while I was in Joshua Tree, this, a, a place, by the way, that inspired Cubic Sky. Um, and, but, you know, like, I've always wanted to be like a Hudson River School painter. I always wanted to, like, depict nature in its sublime glory. But for me, you know, uh, nature is always sort of like, ha has within it, you know, um, a sort of political aspect. There, there, it's, it's, you know, there, there's a, like, genocide and slavery and water rights and political boundaries, and they're all, like, tied up with this notion of nature. So I thought I would try to, like, put a sort of a scrim over uh, of other kinds of information that you have to look through to see these, these sort of nocturnes. So I did a series of these works here. I'll just show them really quickly. Uh, a piece called Ripple Trees, um, Blue Circles. Anyway, you get, the idea. you get the idea. This is a piece called um, Double Landscape. Uh, this is a little painting, a little tondo I did uh, of uh, where I painted uh, 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 Pecos National Forest in uh, New Mexico. But the, uh, the surrounding landscape or the surrounding patterns are, um, are of the same landscape but in, in, in uh, topographical map form and uh, with little saccharine pills uh, dotting it. And um, so it's like two ways of dis depicting landscape. So anyway, um, a lot of the work, a lot of the objects and plant material come out of my backyard. So uh, this is like a, I live in Williamsburg. I've lived there for like over 30 years. This is my backyard. And um, there's some Datura there. Um, I picked this Datura, uh, uh, a, a little seed pod, right in front of George O'Keefe's house uh, in Abiquiu, New Mexico, and brought it back home with me. And it's been proliferating in my backyard along with uh, San Pedro cactuses and a bunch of other magic plants. So then what I end up doing is like I'll, I'll, plant, I'll press all these things into plant presses and then, and, uh, and then with, uh, with uh, the pre-cut collage material uh, and, uh, and in many cases pills, uh, these become like my sort of palette that I end up working on. Uh, this is a piece in progress here. I have a bridge. I usually work on the ground, um, laying things out. I get up on a ladder. I look down. When I think things are good, I glue them all down. Um, and and uh, this is a piece here that came out of, this is a piece that's eight by 20 feet. It's called um, uh, uh, Gravity's Rainbow. And, um, and, and, and a lot of the work uh, at this particular point, this was made in uh, 1999. Uh, this is where I just took a, a giant pull chain, uh, you know, that you would t turn off and on a light, uh, above light switch with, and I hooked them all together to be 18 feet, and I just would drape it into catenaries and then draw these, these arcs. 
uh, and then fill them up, uh, fill them up with uh, uh, ornament. It's very indebted to the work of, I think, Sola Witt, who, a uh, conceptual artist, who talked about, um, about um, the mind as um, the machine that makes art and that we then just execute it. In my case, there was this mind that was conceiving the work, but then there was like all this intuitive relationship, uh, like what, how I was going to ornament this, this skeletal structure. So. Um, there's a lot of, uh, it, it was very inspired, I think, by black Tibetan tankas, uh, the, the garland of severed heads that one sees in tankas, for instance, was very, uh, um, in, in, uh, very influential on these like severed body parts. But there, there's also a lot of like paint, sun pills, uh, photo collage, real leaves. And I guess with me, uh, when you're looking at my work, it's really hard, I think, sometimes to ascertain uh, the reality of the objects that one, are, one sees. It's the, the, the paint, the photographs, and the real objects all sort of coexist within the same plane. And that notion of, um, um, uh, you, you know, that, that fuzziness of the reality of the objects is also something that I'm very interested in. This is very similar to, uh, um, to uh, Gravity's Rainbow. This is called Echo, Wow, and Flutter, another synesthesia piece. This is, it's just basically uh, uh, Gravity's Rainbow turned on its side and then flipped over into a, 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 you know, a, a bipolar uh, abstraction. And uh, so with a little bit of Tibetan fire here in the, in the center. Uh, and then there's Bird Blast. Just going to go through these really quickly. This I made on a lazy Susan. I just uh, would uh, build. I built out from the center birds. And these are mostly collage birds, and uh, and hemp leaves and pills. And then I just sort of worked out until I got to the end of it. So being a frugal guy, uh, I had all these voids left for my field guides. I'm a birder, by the way, as well. Um, and uh, a lot of my hobbies that I have, like gardening, birding, fly fishing, they all end up in surfing, they all end up in my work. Uh, you know, uh, I love this notion of the double take. I love the idea of like setting up a premise, um, uh, um, a, a thing as a painting, and then when you get up close, you realize that it's made out of a lot of different kinds of things. And in this case, I made these. These, with these voids, I started putting this polar fleece and Gore-Tex outerwear garments from uh, Land's End catalogs to try to roughly emulate the shape uh, or the anatomy of the birds so that when you see them from across the room, you just think they're, uh, um, you know, just regular uh, like Audubon's or field guides. And then you get up close, you see the zippers and, uh, and uh, the buttons and stuff. But also, you know, it, it was a way of me conflating two ways of seeing nature or using nature. You know, you're, we're walking around naming it with our books and we're dressed in our petrochemical based, you know, Gore-Tex polar fleece. And then it also maybe asked the question of like, well, what, what, what's so wrong that the birds have to wear those outfits? But <laughs> so, so I, I guess, you know, a, a lot of what artists what I had to deal with um, growing up in the 70s is the, the, the sort of the, the rubble of utopianism. You know, basically having, I, I grew up pretty close to Laguna Beach and I got to watch, you know, the, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love and Timothy Leary get arrested and bailed out by uh, the Black Panthers. And I got to watch the sort of fallout of the 60s and, um, and, and I started thinking about how th that, this notion, the rubble of utopianism, was also uh, something that, uh, uh, as, uh, as artists, we also deal with. I mean, uh, with the futurists, you know, eventually morphed into fascists, or, 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 the, or the idea of, like, Malevich being co-opted by, by, uh, by Stalin, and, uh, and, and becoming a Stalinist. And... Um, and, and, and that, that kind of, that sort of legacy of failure and walking through the rubble of this, this world that, that I was trying to figure out what to do with, um, you know, was something, uh, you know, trying to find things worth saving uh, was, was, was a real question for me. Um, this is a work called uh, New Jerusalem. And uh, it, it looks like a, a happy, peaceful little valley, but um, this is like, th these are all basically, uh, um, 
separatist structures from American history, uh, the Unabomber cabin, Charles Manson's hideout, uh, Drop City Commune, uh, Aryan Nations compound, Mormon polygamous houses. I, you get the idea, Shaker meeting halls. So instead of like being a, a happy little beautiful town of peace and quiet, it's this town of hate. And, and suspicion. And, 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 I, and I started thinking about this notion of, you know, uh, of, the new, of New Jerusalem, this new Eden, that America, this American experiment. And, uh, and I, it, it, you know, for me, you know, landscape became this idea of the imposition of ideology onto nature. And uh, having been, like, hadn't, having had lived in Vermont, had been with a bunch of back-to-lander types, uh, this, this was, uh, you know, just really, really interesting to me. So uh, we'll flip around here. We'll go through some stuff. Um, this is a work uh, called Untitled Expulsion. It's, it's sort of based on Masaccio's uh, expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. That's sort of the, the, the basic myth that deals with uh, our separation from Eden and, and, and the utopian, ut utopic thrust of, of history that is within its wake. In this case, uh, well, let's see here. Wait. In this case, uh, right there is a little like psilocybin mushroom. I decided to like had the uh, hubris to try to depict God uh, in, in this work here. So, uh, and so this is a, a variety of works here that were inspired directly by Tibetan Tonkas. This is a piece called uh, Breathing Head. Uh, and it was also, I would, I would say, very much inspired by the uh, folk anthology by Harry Smith, all these sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, songs uh, in the American songbook about death and, and the cosmic sublime. And uh, I was like, think, I was dealing a lot with, uh, reading a lot with, uh, 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 th uh, I was listening a lot to Harry Smith at the time. Uh, this is called Field Guides. This could be a guy from New Jerusalem Commune there working away. Toytopia, expecting to fly. And this work is also very indebted to the work of Giuseppe Arcimboldo, um, uh, a, um, uh, 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 a guy who was very, uh, uh, who operated in the, in the 1500s in Italy, in the Renaissance. This is a piece called um, Airborne Event. This was very much based on, um, I was reading Don DeLillo's White Noise where he talks about a toxic airborne event. And, uh, and then, uh, so I was making this sort of chemical cloud that was gonna all be uh, like hexagons. But then at a certain point, I just veered off and started thinking about alien space abduction and the assumption of the Virgin Mary into heaven. And, uh, and there you have it. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, um, I, I went and segued from people, and, and these birds now became surrogates for human activity. Uh, so I'm just going to show you a few of these. These are all uh, sort of made out of like cut flowers and, um, and, and various other things. Um, this is like, you know, the snake is made out of literally hundreds of snakes that I've cut together to make a mega snake. and. Uh, this is called Migrant Fruit Thugs. Those are, uh, uh, one of the things that's happened in my work is I, I'm no longer using drugs in my work, and though I still use leaves and sometimes psychoactively, uh, um, many of the leaves I use now are not. I, I, I sort of feel like that the work itself, uh, as, it's, as it's gained sort of power with a sort of a, a psychedelic aesthetic, it's almost like the work itself has consumed its own drugs and it no, they no longer need to be there. And uh, so in this case, I, I, these are fig leaves from my backyard. And this was sort of based on an event where I, uh, migration was coming through. I saw a bird in my, eating my figs. I was going to chase it off because I thought it was a starling and it turned out to be a red-breasted grosbeak, which is very cool. So I let it eat my figs and that became that. <laughs> so uh, and that's also like eight by six and a half feet. And these, th these works are quite heavy, I might add. Uh, so we're just sort of moving through the, uh, we got here a raven. I like this one here uh, only because it seems so edible. And, um, and uh, I mean, it's sort of, and, and it is, but, it, but I, I really enjoy the sort of Darwinism of the, of the object. So 
So is that bird feeding that his baby snake or is the baby snake killing him? This is the work me and my son worked on together. He's, uh, he's, he's sort of, he's very much of a materialist and so uh, he's really into gemstones. So uh, we built this work together. Uh, a, a lot of times I'll, I'll be in my studio and, uh, and I'll be rubbing my eyeballs and uh, you get these phosphines that like flick around and I would try to draw them really quickly before they would fade away. <laughs> So, uh, just going to run through here really quickly. This is a work that uh, called Abductor. This was made while channeling uh, uh, Katrina. Uh, and uh, I was thinking about the tornadoes, the water spouts that were coming up. And uh, anyway, there you go. I went back to, uh, I think I'll, I'm going to end with this piece here. This is called My Night Music for Raptors. And uh, it's hundreds of bird's eyes put together to make an owl, but it, they're also could be seen as two um, uh, turntables as seen from above, but it can also, and the little dots could be seen as the stars at the night and uh, the hooting of the owls. And I think that's it. Thank you. Fred, Fred Tomaselli, thank you so much. Thank you for your beautiful work. Thank you for that beautiful work. So, um, who are some questions? Hi. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work. It's beautiful. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the relationship um, that you have with sort of the otherness that is, um, you know, part of the creative process, but is also part of the psychedelic process or psychedelic experience. Um, sort of the that otherness? Inter yeah, like the interaction with that spirit world, if you see parallels to the psychedelic experience like I see you're you know using materials that are from the psychedelic experience but also like wondering if you have sort of communication with um, that entity you know that is similar to when you are experiencing psychedelics sure for me the psychedelic experience um, has been uh, one of un unbounded mystery um, part of me has a, a materialist um, look at it, like that this is, these are chemicals that are interacting with the brain, and, this, and then part of me feels that this is opening up a parallel reality to other dimensions, um, that, that, um, towards a, a very spiritual sort of reality. And either way you look at it, there, it's still amazing. It's still a mystery to me. Like, even if it is just chemicals, even if it is just an, a brain organ that's just being, you know, that with serotonin receptors going loco, even if it's that, it, blo it still blows my mind. And, uh, and for me, that question uh, about, it's about how it, how it um, alters consciousness uh, and what it's doing that, uh, that, it, it, that underlying question for me can never really fully be answered. And that's what keeps me going back to that experience to try to tease out what it means. Um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, you know, there's, there's this, you know, I'm, I'm of two minds of it. And I think those, like, I'm taking both those minds and I'm putting it in there. I think a lot of my work has ideological warfare going on inside of it anyway. So, uh, you know, because of my relationship to conceptual art doesn't mean that I have to, like, dislike uh, Asian art, ancient Asian art, or Renaissance art. And so, for me, like, the, the, these, these, these uh, polarities that I bounce between I, I feel are, uh, um, they can never really fully be resolved and that's why I, fi I find it interesting as, as a subject for making art. Another question. Over I, I was wondering if you could talk at all about um, if you use psychedelics during the creative process and if, basically have any of these been inspired while you were in altered states or do you use heightened states to work out the ideas of your paintings? The first part of my work up to uh, 1997, um, I was, um, I've, had, I've had sporadic periods where I've investigated or dip, dipped back into psychedelia or psychedelic experience. Right after punk rock broke, I started dropping a lot of acid around 1980 
and I think maybe that became the impetus for where I ended up today, but I also did a whole bunch in the uh, mid-90s before the birth of my son, and uh, that's probably uh, like uh, I, I had uh, that work, uh, uh, Double Landscape, for instance, was done right around that time uh, when I was living in upstate New York. Um, but I haven't really done any psychedelic sense, uh, but now that my son's off to college, I don't know. <laughs> It, it does get a little weird in my studio because when you're using the, but the, I, I will talk about drug use a little bit. When when uh, when you are using marijuana and you're laying it out on your pieces and you're smoking the same pot that you're laying out, this idea of the feedback loop between you and the objects that you you know artists talk about that you know I mean that's an amazing feedback loop where the uh, the objects themselves are speaking from inside your own brain you know so. Uh, so it can get a little funny in the studio. So, um, but that's about it for me. It's mostly coffee, you know. It's, I mostly just drink a lot of coffee. Another question. For those of us living in a hyper-industrialized urban environment, how can we care more about the environment, sustainability, short of doing more mushrooms? I, I, I don't, you, how can we care more about the environment? Yeah, how can we care more about environmental sustainability and um, maybe working with organizations and governments to have more environmental protections? Dropping acids totally put me in touch with nature in a way that I, I um, never could have imagined. And, and, and it's my deep belief that the ecology movement um, you know, uh, kind of came about primarily uh, by a bunch of people who had had a, um, a feeling of oneness with nature, and 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 uh, and, and and so that really um, had elevated my relationship to nature and and my uh, my desire to protect it. But uh, I, but I don't really know. Uh, I, you know, I don't even know if I'm a. I, I can't really. I'm not really advocating for for any, poli any kind of politics within my own work, and I don't even know if I'm answering your question, but what I am advocating for is the sense of that the world is this amazing, profuse, gorgeous, um, complicated uh, thing full of organisms that are like interacting with one another, and it's just so beautiful. And I want to put that in my work. And I, I just want to put that in my work. And I really feel that there was something that happened with my relationship with psychedelic drugs that was a catalyst, if you will, for something like that to happen within me. Another question? Over there. Fred, two questions. Um, how old was your son when the two of you worked on that piece together? And uh, again, I love your art. Do you have, the, have you turned any of it into uh, an affordable medium, like a poster or something like that, where we can, uh, I can acquire it? The average person doesn't have the money to... Yeah. Uh, my son is 18. Uh, he's going uh, uh, to become a computer engineer and you work for an evil corporation, and I love him very much. And, um, and uh, I, um, I, uh, there's, there's a lot of books that, I've, that are out on my work, including, I didn't even get to talk about the New York Times projects that I've been doing for the last 12 years. Um, but, um, and there's, uh, there are posters out there in the world. I think MoMA has a poster uh, that you could buy from their gift shop. And if you wait, you know, uh, yeah, so there's stuff out there in the I'm world. You so um, I think there's even uh, a puzzle I just made, uh, which is like so ridiculously hard that I don't know if anybody could ever make it. Yeah, I don't know. It's almost a joke. Other questions? Hi. Hi. I love your work too. Thanks. I think it's really interesting. Um, so I've never really done psychedelics, but I felt like the world is wonderful. 
and it's great. Um, you can get there that way too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, it's like, just a shortcut. That's all. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. And but I have a hard time like feeling like that all the time. What's that? Like I have a hard time feeling like life is great all the time. But but it. I agree like, with you. But listening to you made me like feel like you seem to experience more of life in the greater side. So I was wondering, what's your strategy? What's my what? <laughs> strategy. My strategy? Oh, uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm really, really lucky person. You know, I get to make art full time. Um, I, I got a, a, a house with a garden. I'm, you know, happily married. I have a beautiful son. And, um, you know, I just, it's my, I have a really great life. And, and uh, you know, I kind of, I grew up working class, oldest of six kids, struggling immigrant parents, the whole bit. So, uh, I, I never felt entitled to the life I have. It's like, it blows my mind that I have it. And um, so I'm just really thankful for it. So uh, there's no reason to be, a, you know, a, you know a, a jerk about it, <laughs> complain about it. I you know, I love my life. Very lucky. For the work that contains Schedule One drugs, do you ever have any trouble shipping it around the world uh, for shows? Does the DA, DEA ever bug you or at your studio? Or? It's, it's, it's funny, um, you know, legality has been an issue uh, since the get-go, and it was never my intention to, um, um, you know, to be transgressive on purpose. You know, I was just using the objects that were a natural part of my life, the detritus of my life, and just using them in a way that I felt was really obvious. That being said, um, at a certain point, uh, that did become something of an issue, and, um, and, and, and my work was all confiscated in, in France for an ex exhibition, um, and, and sent to Rouen, where it was in this uh, holding area with diseased chickens and... <laughs> And, uh, you know, fake Louis Vuitton bags and stuff. And, and we did get the Minister of Culture, Jacques Lang, to release my work. Um, and it turned out, though, that it wasn't about Schedule One drugs. It turned out that the French were trying to protect their pharmaceutical industry. And uh, that they thought I was trying to export in this, like, elaborate ruse, American drugs into, a, into France. So anyway, it was weird. But I try to show my work in, in crime-plagued cities where the cops have uh, something else to do other than arrest paintings. And, and for the most part, I, I haven't had any trouble. But, you know, I've tried to keep, a, try to keep... You know, I'm in the ghetto of the art world. Who cares? You know what I mean? It's like just a small little thing. I just do my stuff and so far so good. And I haven't really made a big deal about it. You know, so, so, yeah, so far. And I'm not really even making work with drugs anymore, so I guess I dodged that bullet. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you, Fred. <laughs>